Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, could you just stand to say the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we just have a few announcements. Um, next month's meeting is going to be with Brian and here you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm still so not speaking loud enough. Next month's meeting is the 1964-1965 World's Fair. It's the second part of the 1939 World's Fair presentation that Brian said is Endonacio. Okay, Endonacio. All right. Um, also, there's going to be ballots for this year's election, which will be going out soon. If there's anyone interested in running for a position, please speak to one of um, the presiding board members in the green shirt and the everybody who's got the green shirt on. Um, FINS is celebrating 15th anniversary and is asking us to um, create a display for the exhibit at the FINS terminal, which is um, the ferry terminal on West Wait. Avenue, okay? And for the summer, we invite anyone who has an item that they think might be of interest to speak with Jim Roselle. We're setting up all different pictures and everything, so it'll be really nice. Um, if anyone has dues, please see Steve. Raise your hand in the back. Okay, um, just a little thing from Allison. Um, she said, our speaker tonight will be giving a presentation on George Washington's Culver Spry Ring. Patchogue is proud of the fact that Austin Rowe, who was part of the ring, of that ring, moved to Patchogue in the later years and is buried here at the Cedar Grove Cemetery. Many of his descendants were great contributors to Patchogue, Patchogue's growth and development. Next week happens to be a special Patchogue anniversary on Wednesday, April 22nd is the 225th year anniversary that President Washington stopped here and dined at the Patchogue, in, I'm sorry, in Patchogue at the Hearts Tavern. Um, during his uh, 1790 victory tour of Long Island, though opinions differ on the existence of Hearts Tavern, we have it in the President's diary that he halted while at, at I'm sorry, while at one Green's just, one Green's distant, I don't know what that means, 11 miles, and dined at Hearts Tavern in Brookham Haven Town, ship five miles further. Okay, so that's what that says. So this is a little bit, and we also have notices about the World's Fair um, show. It was really great last time, and everyone really enjoyed it. So he, he brings a lot of memorabilia, and so it was a great show. Hopefully everybody can meet and join us. Okay, Tyler. <coughs> From the Three Village Historical Society. Thank you, sir. Hello. 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 I don't get to drain it my own place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have some books up here. I have seven books to consider history, and I have nine of novels. Uh, novels include George Washington's Secret City. The histories include Washington Spies by Alexander Rose. Just for your information. The one I have. <laughs> 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 General George Washington took command of the Continental Army in Boston in the spring of 1775 and began the process of turning the uh, group of militias into an army. Intelligence has always been conducted by inserting spies into enemy territory, gathering information, and then leaving before being discovered. This method did not prove accurate, useful intelligence. And they did that for two years, between 1776 and 1778. 
Washington moved his five to 7,000 troops to Manhattan in the spring of 76 after he defeated the British in Boston. The British arrived in New York on June 22nd with more than 40 ships and 6,000 troops. Within a week, there were over 400 British ships and over 30,000 troops in New York. Washington's intelligence underestimated the British strength. His intelligence was not good these first two years. <laughs> the execution of Nathan, Nathan Hale, of Benjamin Talmadge's best friend at Yale College, was one of the factors in Talmadge's interest in obtaining better intelligence. This is Long Island, um, Staten Island, Southern Westchester, came under British control in August and September of 1776. Um, and remained so until the British Army withdrew in November 1783. They only did have two of the roads that were in existence then, North Country Road and South Country Road. Uh, of course, there was also a Middle Country Road that was already established by this time as well. That um, maybe don't always get it right. Let's go back to that second. The British control all of Long Island, Manhattan, Southern Westchester, and Staten Island. Most of their troops, uh, Hessians and English troops, were on Staten Island. It made it difficult for Washington to know exactly how many troops there were, and he certainly wasn't going to send any spies to Staten, Staten Island, which was basically um, just crawling with the British troops. In December of 1776, the royal governor, William Tryon, visited the Green and Sassauga and required all men to sign the Pledge of Allegiance to the British Crown. This was, uh, this was also repeated throughout British control of Long Island. And you can see there, <coughs> Is that better? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. You can see here that Benjamin Hawkins was one of the, uh, age 23, was one of the uh, men who signed the pledge to the British Crown. He also signed the Pledge of Allegiance uh, in 75 to uh, the Patriot cause. But since he stayed on Long Island, he didn't have a choice. If you stayed, you signed it. Same thing happened to uh, Abraham Woodall. Uh, Austin Rowe, Anna Smith Strong, they all had to sign it. This is actually an original copy that belongs to the Historical Society. There are copies all over Long Island and throughout the 13 colonies. By the way, these paintings are um, by Vance Locke. They, they're murals that hang in the Setauket School and they were painted in 1951, 1952. And um, Tuesday, two days ago, the um, auditorium was open. It's open once a year so that people can go in and see the murals. They're quite impressive. They're a lot larger than you're seeing them here. Okay, the Battle of Setauket occurred on August 22nd, 1777. And um, in this area, you see, um, we've labeled the Setauket Presbyterian Church, the British Encampment, Caroline Church, Episcopal, the Woodhall Farm, Anna Smith Strong's house, right there, her manor, right there, which the British took over because it was one of the nicest houses in, on Long Island. And um, the map was drawn by Major Holland, in 1777 because they did maps of all the areas where they had forts. So that was important. But it gives us a good map we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, Loyalist Colonel Richard Hewlett defended the fort and if any of you have been watching Turn, they show him as a British officer with a white wig and all kinds of stuff like that. He wouldn't be, be wearing uh, blue and he wouldn't be wearing a wig, and he wouldn't be treating Americans as badly as 
Colonel Hugh that treats them in the in the movie. How many of you watched her? Okay. Unfortunately, it's not appropriate for children, especially fourth graders, which uh, if it was real history, it would matter. But since it isn't, it doesn't matter. I've had a number of people come to me and say that they're doing um, another version uh, or they're working on it or this, that, or the other thing. And I always talk to them. Um, I haven't seen any production of anything like that, but it really would be nice to get the real story out there. Um, in, in something that the kids could uh, really tie into. Um, some nice either cartoon version or some other version that could be shown to the fourth graders. But turn is not, not it. If you go to the Village Green and go to Patriots Rock, which is open to the public because it's owned by the Three, Vill the, uh, Three Village Community Trust, um, it'll have the date of August 24th on it rather than 22nd. It's written in stone, so to speak. It's written on a, a plaque, and it's been that way ever since the Daughters of the Revolution put a post at the plaque back in the 1930s. I wanted to point out that at the bottom there, in 1777, Joseph Brewster was president of the Brookhaven Town Trustees, and Benjamin Floyd was the supervisor. They were both loyalists. You gotta remember, Long Island was under British control. You also have to remember that the majority of people on Long Island were loyalists. They were Tories. That doesn't count the East End, of course. There never been Tories out there, at least according to them. <laughs> um, so, when the war started, more than 50% of the population of Brookhaven was Tory. That changed. But in the election of 1777, uh, Joseph Brewster was, uh, and Benjamin Floyd were elected as president of the trustees and a trustee for the first time. We'll talk more about that. Nathan Hale and Benjamin Talmadge were good friends in college. They both went to Yale College. They both graduated and after four years and went to, uh, into Connecticut as school teachers. When the war started, Talmadge went up to Boston with um, uh, Nathan and Enoch Hale. Um, the three of them hung around together all through college. And to figure out what was going on, Hale jo and uh, uh, Talmadge joined up right away. Hale did it. He wrote a letter to Talmadge, which is in his autobiography, that says, I want to join up too, I'm a patriot. And he trusted Talmadge. He sort of looked up to him, more like an older brother as well as a friend. Talmadge wrote him back and said, don't do it. You'll make a good teacher, you'll make a good minister, but you won't make a good soldier. You're just not cut out for it. Talmadge was one of those guys who really knew his military. He took to it very quickly, very easily, and he knew what he was talking about. Unfortunately for Nathan Hale, um, he was hung by um, uh, the royal governor um, in New York, not the royal governor, the, um, the head of the British Army, um, General Howe, um, the next day after he was caught. One of the spies, who was the chief of the spies in Setauket, was Abraham Woodall. He was born in Setauket in 1750. I mentioned a crop there. He grows wheat, corn, and grasses. And, and I think I did that because of the fact that Turn came out and said he was growing cabbages. Well, he wasn't. <laughs> also, Abraham Woodall wasn't married until 25th of November, 1781. After the war was really going bad for the British. And he felt safe. Safe enough 
to marry Mary Smith, who became his wife. And they didn't have any children until 1785. And their first two children were, were girls, as opposed to what's in turn. And they didn't have a boy, Jesse, until 1796. As a spy, he wasn't a bit interested in starting a family with not knowing what was going on. But he was a farmer. That's all he ever wanted to be. He didn't want to be a spy, but he did it because everybody has to do something. And he mentions that a number of times in his various uh, spy letters to Talmadge. We always get the impression that, they, that we didn't know about the spies uh, prior to Morton Pennypacker in the 1930s. That's not true. Everybody knew Talmadge. Everybody knew Brewster was operating. They just didn't know the rest of them. But they actually did, at least in town. This is a copy of a right out of the history of Long Island by uh, Benjamin Franklin Thompson. And it says, they're talking about Benjamin Talmadge, he opened this year a secret correspondence for General Washington with some persons in New York, and particularly with the late Abraham Wardell of Setauke, which lasted throughout the war. He kept one or more boats constantly employed in crossing the town on this business. He could have mentioned Brewster, he didn't. This is 1839 way before, uh, almost a hundred years before um, Morton Pennypacker uh, uncovered the identity of Robert Townsend, the New York connection. So, how many people in Setauket knew the identity of Abraham Woodall and what he was doing? Knew that he was a, uh, a patriot and not a Tory? I think a lot did. We can't prove it one way or the other, but it's a small town. Did people like Benjamin Floyd, who was a Tory all during the war and was a, a listed as a colonel in the militia, uh, Tory militia, did he know? Well, he lived in the same town. Win or lose, he's going to have to live with these people after the war. Did he know that, that Woodhull was doing secret messages or the extent of it? Probably not, but I bet you knew something and didn't say it. The Tories that did say things like that were the ones that got kicked out of Long Island after the war, because a lot of Tories on Long Island lost their property because of what they did to treat the Patriots. A lot didn't. Abraham Woodall operated as a spy for General Washington as Samuel Culper, um, his uh, code name, from September of 1778 until June of 79. He was a spy in New York City. Um, he became Samuel Culper Sr. in June of 79 until the end of the war because at that point he appointed Robert Townsend to be the man in New York, and instead of giving him a different code name, um, he just made himself senior and him junior. That's a picture of his house, which burned in 1931. Um, his uh, descendants um, set it on fire accidentally. Uh, the newspaper article says that um, they uh, probably left a lamp burning on the table in the kitchen and who knows, cat, knock it over, dog, whatever. Um, so the house burned to the ground. How much of Benjamin, uh, how much of Abraham Woodhull's papers were lost, we don't know. But his diary for, that, for the Revolutionary War period is at the East Hampton Library. And it's being um, completely, um, um, it's been being completely translated into um, on the computer by Barbara Russell, a Brookhaven Town historian. So eventually we'll see it all. It's a terribly written diary because he jumps all over the page. It's like any day that he wanted to put an entry in, he just opened the book to whatever page happened to be and wrote in. 
So it, it's very difficult diary to uh, understand. And he mentions things like getting a certain amount of gold and then doing something with it. He doesn't say what. Where is he going to get gold? He's a farmer. He's a talker. Well, he's getting it from Washington. If Washington knew that he was making an account of the gold that he got for being a spy, he would have been a scans. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to keep a record. <laughs> Only the Germans kept records in the Second World War. This is Little Bay, where the Woodhull home is. You see it marked. And Asmus Strong's uh, temporary home across the way there. And um, that's the, how close they were to each other. And of course, there's lots of water around, lots of places for Caleb Brewster to pull in his well room. This is the actual route that the spies took from New York City across the Brooklyn Ferry, and then one of the three major routes to Setauket. It takes, um, a horse travels at six miles an hour, and it's 60 miles from Brooklyn Ferry to Setauket. So how many hours minimum does it take? <laughs> well, ten hours. ten hours, okay. That's it, I think I'm teaching, you know? You guys are gonna have to put up with it because I do this mostly for fourth graders. <laughs> <laughs> Along the route between Brooklyn and Setauk were many places that Austin Road could stop with a friendly place. And we know that because at one point, Benjamin Talmadge asks um, Robert Townsend to come out and talk to him. Because Townsend got scared. When uh, Benedict Arnold uh, became a traitor and goes from West Point to New York City, as now as a British general, it scared the devil out of Robert Townsend. Because he doesn't know what uh, Benedict Arnold knows or doesn't know. He doesn't know that he doesn't know the names of all the spies. He didn't. In fact, one letter from, um, from him to uh, General Washington from Benedict Arnold, he says, I have some information I need to get to your uh, spy ring. Could you please tell me the names of the people so I can contact them? He's one of the top five generals in the, in the American Army. It's, it's a, I guess, a legitimate question. Washington didn't tell him. Washington says, my chief of intelligence is Benjamin Talmadge. If you need to get anything to him, and he'll, and he'll get it to the proper people. So Washington knew that only the people who absolutely had to know were in the know. And Robert Townsend didn't know that. And for six months, he wouldn't put a pen to paper between August of, of, uh, se uh, of, of 1780 and six months. And Woodhull had to go in and pat him on the head and tell him how nice a guy he was and how important he was and all this kind of thing. And at one point, he wanted to come out and talk to him. They were going to meet at Smithtown. Meet at Smithtown? <laughs> Well, obviously, there's somebody or some place in Smithtown where they were able to meet. We don't know that. We don't have any idea. We eventually may find out, but we don't know now. We don't know a lot. A lot about the spy ring we don't know. The messages went from Setauket with Caleb Brewster across Long Island Sound to um, Fairfield and then by uh, Talmadge to Washington's headquarters. By 1779, when uh, Robert Townsend took over in New York, Washington had said to Talmadge, I don't want you to do this anymore. I don't want you to be the only person that takes these messages to headquarters. You're too important. I've got too much else for you to do. So I want you to train a number of your dragoons, your mounted uh, cavalry soldiers. I want you to train them. I want you to sign, have them sign this piece of paper saying that they will never reveal who they got the message for, from what was in the message, when they got it, where they took it, or anything about it. 
And that's, from then on, um, not only was the spy ring operating better because uh, Robert Townsend was in New York rather than Woodhull, but, um, but Talmadge didn't have to do it all himself. Washington had a number of different headquarters, at least 17 different wire. And, you know, he moved around, on a moving target, you know, that kind of thing. Because the British rose after him. Austin Rowe, born 1748 in Drowned Meadow, Fort Jefferson. You probably all know that. And he went to school in Setauket, because that was the only school. And with his friends, uh, Abraham Woodhull, who was uh, two years younger than him, Caleb Brewster, who was one year older, um, and um, eventually um, Benjamin Talmadge, who was a youngster, he was born four years after Woodhull. Um, but he was ready to go to college at the age of 13. His father made him wait a year. So he was 15 by the time he attended Yale. But one of the things that they talk about Austin Rowe is that he broke his leg while rushing to lead Washington from Corum to Setauket. It didn't happen. I don't know if he broke his leg. I really don't. But he was not going to be the person who led Washington from Corum to Setauket. Because after 1780, while the British were still on Long Island, Seal Strong was elected as supervisor of the town of Brookhaven. The Tories and or Loyalists had had their day. By 1780, the majority of people in the town of Brookhaven were patriots because of the way they'd been treated. I mean, officially, uh, the British took a lot of stuff off Long Island. In fact, when they came to New York, they assumed that Long Island would be their supply base. Well, 30,000 people, there aren't anywhere near that many on Long Island at this point. They stripped Long Island of anything that was important pretty early in the game. And they treated the uh, Patriots and Tories, it didn't matter. They treated Americans the same. They treated them terribly. And what, what they didn't take officially and give chips for, which they never paid for, by the way. I know, because uh, Rufus Langhans went to uh, London to see the mayor of London to try to get the money back. Uh, he went in full uniform. And uh, they, they fed at him all over the place. He had a good time. But he never got anything. But um, in addition to that, they allowed their soldiers to, to take what they wanted. There was no restrictions. So by 1780, Long Island was stripped clean. In fact, British sold, uh, British officers were going through places in Queens and uh, Suffolk were, were amazed at how uh, they didn't see any animals, they didn't see anything. So it was really bad. Of course, they may have hidden a few. But Seal was strong would have been the, the person who led Washington from Corum to uh, Setauket. He was the head of the town of Brookhaven. This is New York. Um, and right here is James Rivington's coffee house. Robert Townsend store on Peck Slip. And right about here is the boarding house of Amos Underhill. Amos Underhill was married to Abraham Woodhull's sister, Mary. That was the reason that Talmadge appointed Abraham Woodhull to be the spy in New York. Because as a farmer in Setauket, he had a sister he could stay with in New York City and gather information. And Amos Underhill was a resident of Oyster Bay and ran a business in New York. Robert Townsend ran a business in New York and lived in Oyster Bay. They're second cousins. So between September of 78, when Abraham Woodhull first started to uh, um, 
work as the chief spy in New York until June of, of 79 when he appointed Robert Townsend, he was probably told by his sister and, and uh, brother-in-law that Robert Townsend could be trusted. <clears throat> but it took him that much time to appoint Robert Townsend or get him to do the job. It's rough. I mean, you've been working with nobody but Satorkin people for a long time. Since 78, you've been working with all just Satorkin people. Now you've got to trust somebody who's not a Satorkin resident. And he did. But he also wanted out. Woodhull was scared to death of going back and forth to New York City. It wasn't a good thing for him. How many times can he go in there taking supplies in um, for the British and visiting his sister? And he was really worried that, and it was good, it was a good deal for taking it. He, he, um, he took Anna Smith Strong with him a number of times, posing as his wife. And he did that because they didn't search women. In fact, in one of the letters I'll show you, they say so. Anna Smith Strong was uh, lived on a Seton's net. She didn't own it. Sheila didn't own it. It was owned by a man named Seton because her father, Anna Smith's father, William Henry Smith, lost the neck due to financial reverses. But Seton was a Tory, a loyalist, operating out of New York City. And for the first year or so of the war, his family was in Setauket and Strong's Neck at the manor. And in one particular case, one of the whaleboat raiders came over and really attacked the manor just before the British were based there and um, scared the devil out of her. She went back to New York City with her kids and didn't come back. And the Seatons never came back. And, and, um, and Sheila Strong bought it at auction after the war. So he got it back. Anna Smith Strong, born in 1740, died in 1812. Sheila, 1737, 1815. Their children, Keturah, born in 1761. Thomas, Del Delilah, Margaret, Benjamin. Mary died the same year she was born. And Joseph, um, born 1850, 1777. Anna Smith Strong, by the time the war, the, the spy ring started in 78, had six children. Now, do you really believe that her husband, Sheila, who was arrested for serendipitous correspondence with the enemy, took those kids to Connecticut with him? Especially the youngest, who she's still nursing, only born in December of 1777. So she stayed on Strong's neck because if she'd gone to Connecticut, where are they going to earn the money? How are they going to live? They've got a farm right here because she still owns her home and some property on Strong's neck, even though most of it's owned by um, a seat. So I don't believe for a minute that that she uh, that those six children went to Connecticut with their father, and I've got no evidence to show it. What I do believe is that they stayed on Long Island with their mother. Captain Seal was strong. In 75, he was a captain of Colonel Smith's regiment. In 76, he was captain of the Brookhaven Minutemen. And from 1767 to 1777, he was a trustee of the town of Brookhaven. What happened in 1777? He got bounced out because the Tories took over. And the last trustees meeting he was present at was May 6, 1777. On January 1778, he was captured and confined in the Sugar House in New York. I like to think that it was one of the uh, trustees, the new trustees of the town of Brookhaven, who said, um, Seal is too powerful. I think we ought to have it. We ought to turn him in, get him arrested. 
Sometime after that, he was released, his wife, Anna Smith Strong, who was supposedly a, a loyalist, according to the British, got him released through the efforts of her family. Most of her family lived in New York City, and most every one of them was, was a loyalist. All of the Smiths in that part of the family were loyalists. Her brother was a definite loyalist. So she got him released, he went to Connecticut. But by 1780, while the British are still here, he's president of the Brookhaven Trustees, and he remained as either president or supervisor until 1797, elected every single year. Andrew Seaton, who owned uh, Seaton's Neck, was given, uh, Strong gave him an IOU for the property in 83. Seaton is still around. Um, after the British left. British didn't leave Long Island when they left New York City either. It took them longer. By May of 84, he's now Judge Seal Strong, holding many other offices. And sometime that year, he issues a certificate of protection to Andrew Seaton, saying, this guy's okay. Leave him alone. He's going to Florida anyway. <laughs> Florida wasn't what it is now. <laughs> but it didn't, wasn't part of the United States either. So he eventually went down to Florida to live out the rest of his life. And on February 85, Seal the Strong purchased Seaton's Neck at auction. I don't imagine there was more than one bidder. Um, and um, he uh, and his wife stayed there the rest of their lives. This is another one of the Vance Lock murals. This is Abraham Woodall, the short guy, and Caleb Brewster um, loading up the whaleboat. And uh, Woodall is giving to Brewster uh, the uh, messages or book or whatever the secret messages were written in. You gotta remember something. The reason they went through Setauket was because going straight north from Manhattan was too dangerous. You couldn't carry messages, you couldn't carry anything. They searched you completely. Because they knew that's the spy room going back and forth. A Talmadge in his autobiography writes uh, about spies captured some, turned some. Or captured many, turned some. Um, the ones he didn't turn, some were hung. But it was dangerous. And Washington wasn't getting good information those two years that they were trying to do that route that way. People were telling him what they thought he wanted to hear, or they were double agents or triple agents or things like that. It just wasn't working. And they're only in New York City for three or four hours anyway, so they're not gathering good intelligence. Not like uh, Woodhull and then uh, um, Robert Townsend, who were living there. But, when you go out to Setauket, you're still in British territory. New York City, Staten Island, Southern Westchester, Long Island are all British territory. The British are not as worried about people going to Setauket because it's all British territory. You're still within the British uh, sphere of influence. The key is getting the messages from Abraham Woodhull's farm to Caleb Brewster. Because then you're going from a Tory-held area to Patriot area. Now how is Abraham Woodhull going to get these messages to Caleb Brewster? Well, he can't just have Caleb Brewster constantly coming up to his house in uniform and handing him the messages. Somebody's going to find out very quickly. So he needs somebody to help him with that. And that person is Anna Smith Strong because she can signal him where Brewster is hiding with his whaleboat. And she does. Whether it's the clothesline, which is the story that uh, Kate Strong tells and is in, the, uh, um, is in Morton Pennypacker's book, we don't know. But we gotta believe some folklore, because if we don't believe folklore, we can't tell the stories about Native Americans. We can't tell the stories about African Americans. We can't tell the story about women in many cases. 
not just during the Revolutionary War, but throughout history. Because there, it's folklore, it's handed down information that is most important. So we have to uh, assume that some of the folklore, based on what we know, is accurate. This is Talmadge's spy code. One of the reasons we know the names of the spies. Here's the numbers, three digit numbers. John Bolton, Benjamin Talmadge, 721. Samuel Culper, 722. Culper Jr., 723. Austin Rose, 724. Caleb Brewster, 725. Why in the devil they didn't give Austin Rowe a secret identity? I have no idea. They captured this code, they'd know he was a spy but they never captured the code. Letters, many letters from Washington to headquarters in Philadelphia and then in uh, Baltimore later, and from them to Washington were captured by the British. But this was never captured. And the reason it was never captured is that whoever needed a copy of this was given it directly by Benjamin Talmadge. It didn't go, th it didn't go through couriers. So it didn't have to travel, except by Talmadge. Places, New York 727, Long Island 728, Satoka 729. All of those, and of course the alphabet code, substituting E for A and F for B and so on and so forth. There were four pages that made up the entire uh, code. <coughs> this is one of the letters. These are all in the Library of Congress. And uh, Washington, knowing how important he would be, especially if he lived and won, had every single piece of correspondence that came into or went out of headquarters copied, put into uh, cases, sealed with straps, sent down to Mount Vernon, and eventually ended up in the Library of Congress. Over 200 of these letters refer directly to the Culper spy ring. They're spy letters. 200 of the thousands of letters in the, in the Library of Congress. And there's others scattered all over the, the world. And it's hard to tell which ones are real and which ones are copies, unless you did a handwriting analysis of all the different people like Alexander Hamilton. But this one's interesting. What we did at the Historical Society is we made a transcription of it. So um, this is from Woodhull to Talmadge, 15 August 1779, and it talks about, it's a great letter, talks about checkpoint searches, outwitting checkpoints, code letters, invisible inks, and it mentions Jonas Hawkins, Anna Smith Strong, Caleb Brewster, and Robert Townsend. Then we took Talmadge's code, the four-page code, and we put onto this chart everything that you'd need to translate that coded message. This is the coded message. And it starts out D-Q-P-E-U-B-O-Y-O-C-P-U, which translates by the alphabet code to, to uh, Jonas Hawkins. Jonas Hawkins didn't have a three-digit code. Um, so they, when they write his name, they had to do it this way, using the alphabet substitution. So it says, Jonas Hawkins, agreeable to appointment, met um, 723 Culper Jr., Robert Townsend, not far from 727 New York, and received a 356, a letter, but on his return was under the necessity to destroy the same or be detected but have the satisfaction to inform you there was nothing of importance to advise you of. They got rid of him. Either he quit because he was so scared and he kept tearing up letters, or <laughs> Woodhull got rid of him. So by uh, June of 17, um, seven, uh, June of 1779, uh, um, Jonas Hawkins was no longer working for the spy ring. Interesting, because he, like Austin Rowe, ran a general store and tavern in Stony Brook. It's now called the Hawkins Mount House. 
Let's go a little further in this. Starting with every. Every letter is opened at the entrance of New York and every man is searched. That for the future, every letter must be written, 691, with the 286 invisible ink received. Well, the whole idea is if you're carrying a coded message, they know you're a spy, they find it. If you're carrying an invisible ink message, they're not going to know that. So the couriers, Austin Rowe, Austin Rowe mentioned it a number of times, um, the couriers did not like to carry coded messages. They'd much rather carry invisible ink messages. Next part. I intend to visit New York before long and think by the assistance of a lady of my acquaintance I shall be able to outwit them all. 355. Lady. That's the only thing 355 means. In fact, in all of Washington's letters, correspondence, everything in the Library of Congress, every piece of original documentation about the Revolutionary War, this is the only place that the code number 355 is used. How the devil you can make up a story about Agent 355 based on that one reference, and they're still doing it, because Brian Kilmeade did it, in spite of talking to me and other people for a year before he wrote his book. And then he comes out with this garbage about Agent 355. 355, in this case, the lady of his acquaintance is obviously Anna Smith Strong. Robert Townsend. First spy letter he wrote, June 20th, 1777. His most important communication was the French fleet warning. He wasn't the only person that notified Washington about the French fleet arriving and the British going to attack him. He wasn't the only one. Washington had lots of spies. But he trusted the co-perspiring because he knew that the information he was getting from them was always good. So when other spies told him things, he used the co-perspiring to determine whether he believed that information or not. So we weren't the only ones to talk about the uh, French fleet warning. Three letters, July 20th, they're all in the same package at the Library of Congress. These three letters, July 20th from uh, Culprit Jr., that's Robert Townsend, to Benjamin Floyd. That's a invisible ink message sent to Benjamin Floyd because he's a Tory. So you write a letter in normal ink to a Tory, and then you write in between the lines with invisible ink. That's how you do it. Well, that letter's in the, in the Library of Congress. The second one is Culper Sr., Abraham Woodhull, to Caleb Brewster. That's to tell him to get across Long Island Town quickly and with this letter because it's the most important thing he's ever done. And if he doesn't, and he doesn't want him to attack British shipping like Brewster is wont to do. In other words, you know, leave him alone. Just get across Long Island Sound. You can go capture somebody later. And July 22nd, Talmadge to Washington explaining what was only briefly explained in the uh, Invisible Ink letter, because you can't do everything. So Talmadge buoyed up all the information from Robert Townsend to Washington in that letter. All three in the same file in the <coughs> Library of Congress. This is the Invisible Ink letter in the Library of Congress, written to Colonel Floyd, signed Samuel Culper, Jr. And he was supposed to write in between the lines with invisible ink. He didn't. Very obvious he didn't. He wrote it at the top. Because what you have here is Alexander Hamilton brushing the reagent across the page until, he, until the message came out. The reagent darkens the page. Now the original message is no longer there. 
because James J. didn't assume that 300 years later we would need to read it. It was only supposed to be for them. So you can't see it anymore. But we know what it says because we know what Talmadge wrote to Washington after the fact. The arrival of the French fleet in Newport and the British fleet and army preparing to attack, destroy, and capture the French fleet. Washington feigned an attack on New York to draw the British back to New York. But this message took four days. Why didn't the British already be in, in uh, Newport attacking the uh, French? Well, the reason is very simple. It's because there's a narrow gap between New York Harbor and Long Island Sound. It's called Hellgate. And there's only supposedly two times a day that you can get through it. Well, during this four days, you couldn't get through at all. The winds were in the wrong direction and it was blowing and the British couldn't get into Long Island Sound for four days, gave Washington time to feign an attack on New York and uh, General Clinton to pull his troops back and save the British, uh, the French fleet. So how many times did weather help Washington win something during the Revolutionary War? Well, this is one more case. And this is the letter from Benjamin Talmadge to General Washington. And at the bottom, it tells you know what file it's in at the Library of Congress. It's the Library of Congress seal up here on every piece of correspondence. People say, well, was Adam Smith Strong really involved? Well. Alexander Rose found this reference in, through the papers of the man, Oliver Delancey, who became the uh, head of, of the British Secret Service in New York after Major Andre was, was hung by Americans. And William Herron was one of his spies. And William Herron writes to Oliver Delancey in New York City on February 4th, 1781, and he writes this, private dispatches are frequently sent from your city, New York, to the chieftain Washington, here by some traders, we call them patriots. They come by the way of Setauket, where a certain Brewster receives them at or near a certain woman's. Duh. <coughs> That's pretty good stuff. Thanks to Alexander Rose. This is um, the members of the spy ring. You see, Jonas Hawkins was a courier between January and June of 79. At the same time that Austin Rowe was a courier, uh, but he stayed with it the whole time. Um, Jonas Hawkins was younger. He was uh, four or five years younger, so can't blame him for that. Could you go back one? Sure. Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, forward. Yeah, but hold on one second. Yeah, we got George Washington, code number 711. Benjamin Talmadge, 721. Abraham Woodall, 722. Robert Townsend, 723. Austin Rose, 724. Caleb Brewster, 725. Anna Smith Strong, with no number. They didn't give women numbers. Women were treated special. Just like Washington treated um, Benedict Arnold's wife, they were never going to do anything to her. She was just shipped off to New York. And they didn't search women. It said so in, in Woodhull's letter. Every man is searched. So he takes Anna Smith Strong with him into New York City. She talks to her Tory relatives and has a nice general conversation about, hey, how are things going here in New York? And then reports back to Woodhull, and he takes her back and, and brings all the information back with him. They didn't search women. If they were caught, they could be hung. If they were caught spying or with messages. But they didn't search them. They didn't search them at the entrance to New York. That's why Woodhull took Aerosmith Strong in New York City with him, because a husband and wife going into New York City was a lot easier than, than going in by yourself. You were much more 
uh, subject to search. Now comes 1790, and Washington's going to make a tour of Long Island. He made three tours. One tour of New England uh, for a few weeks, a southern tour, which took more than that, a month or so, and a four-day tour of Long Island. Why did he tour Long Island? Well, the only answer I can come up with is he was going to go out there to thank the spies. I don't know who the spy was at Jamaica's Warren Tavern. Maybe in the future we'll find out. But um, in Bayshore, where he stopped, what, what's now called Sykes Coast Manor, was the home of Judge Isaac Thompson. Isaac Thompson is the brother of Samuel Thompson of Setauket, and they're both first cousins of Abraham Woodhull. He stayed on he stayed on Long Island the whole war. In fact, he was shot at. They'll tell you that if you go to Sandy Coast Manor, and they'll show you the bullet hole trail that goes up into the attic. The next night in Setauket at the home of Captain Rowe. I measured the distance between Hart Tavern and the Road Tavern. From the Hart Tavern, I traveled east along Montauk Highway or South Country Road to what's now 112, up 112 to Old Town Road, Old Town Road to Gnarled Hollow in Setauket, down Gnarled Hollow to, to 25A Main Street, and then uh, just to the right to the site of the Road Tavern. The distance I measured was within a tenth of a mile of what Washington reported in his diary. Boy, they got, they, they had some, they really knew what they were doing. Next night, they spent at Oyster Bay, the house of Mr. Young, near the home of Robert Townsend. Now, Robert Townsend it doesn't want to have Washington stay there. It's too obvious, number one. It's not because it's a private home. And he was kind of a uh, soft-spoken guy, and he wasn't interested in any PR or publicity or anything. He wasn't even proud of what he did. He's a Quaker. And to be part of the Quaker community, you're not supposed to take sides in conflicts. So he had to downplay it a lot, because uh, his father was an avid patriot and was, was uh, criticized by the, by the um, um, members of his um, community for doing that. Um, and so he, he sort of laid low, never got married, and uh, kind of died in obscurity until Morton Pennypacker found his name. But those are the four places Washington stayed, and we know three of them are connected with aspiring and was spies, although we don't know definitely that Judge Isaac Thompson was a spy, but how could he not be? But we got a lot still we don't know. We got a lot more that we should find out. Maybe the next historian, like Alexander Rose, who comes along and, and digs into and finds more information and more letters and more things will turn up in people's attic. We don't know, but we kind of hope. And that would be nice. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> Any questions? Let me turn the light on. Questions? Anyone? Okay. You don't, uh, you don't like the Tarzan? Oh, I love Tarzan. Oh. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I love all movies. <laughs> but it's Hollywood, you know? And it's better this year than it was last. It's not quite as dark. Although, the point, they are nasty <laughs> on that show. Yes. 
I have a silly question. You know, we go through all these towns where they say Washington slept here, Washington slept there. What's the story behind all these places you slept in and went along on the way to where? Well, it's in his diary. These places are in his diary, his personal diary. Yeah, but was he just visiting, or was his father's spy thing, or where? Well, he was. He was. He had. To, he had to stay the night. I mean, he's not going to travel all night, and he's staying at these four places. You can bet your life he had them set ahead of time. He knew where he was going. There were days travel between each one. And that's what people did. And and most cities, uh, not Long Island particularly, except earlier, but as you go out west. Uh, cities are um, uh, days ride apart. A lot of them. I suppose the Amityville, he slept in Amityville, he slept in uh, He didn't sleep in Amityville. He slept in Bayshore. Bayshore. Well, yeah. There's stories that he slept in Amityville, the hospital, he slept in Oh, and, uh, isn't that? That's another Hollywood story. Okay? There's lots of Hollywood stories out there. A uh, well, perfect Hollywood story is, is Titanic. It wins picture of the year. There's not a single piece of truth in the entire show. You know, I got a bridge up there. Yes. Did Washington travel alone, or did he have an entourage? Oh no, he had an entourage. Washington traveled with an entourage. Remember what? He was feted everywhere. I mean, they didn't leave him alone. By the time he finished his southern tour, he'd had it. I mean, you know, lunch here, big big party lunch, big dinner lunch, big dinner. The chicken, the rubber chicken circuit, you know, but it wasn't chicken. Who, yes. Um, in turn, I'm kind of hoping if they do a third season, they'll show the Battle of Mastic and the burning of the hay and Quorum. They might show that this year. Well, I hope. But my question for you is um, the burning of the hay. I know that was on. That's in the Overton Preserve, like uh, off of Granny Road. But uh -huh. do you know specifically where? No, I don't. It was. I don't. But I do know how important it was. Mm. Because that was the fodder for the British horses for the winter. And uh, another case, of course, it also destroyed any hay that possibly could be used by the, by the uh, farmers in the local area. But it wasn't going to be for them anyway, it's just for the British. And they took what they wanted. And uh, I think everybody in town uh, around Coram was probably very glad to see it burn. Um, I mean, Talmadge uh, spent a whole night under the boats because it was raining at, um, um, Mount, si at uh, Mount Sinai before he went to uh, um, uh, walked across Long Island and attacked the fort. Wasn't anybody who told the British that they were coming, although there were plenty of people living around the area at the time. Other questions here? Yes. Um, I see there was a gap. Uh, they were designated with numbers. Right. Yeah, and he was number seven eleven. Then went to seven twenty. Yeah, it does. Right. Well, it's a good coffee shop story. <laughs> I don't know. That's the only answer I got. <laughs> yes. You know, one of my wife's cousins has uh, has a lot of information about George Washington. And one time, years ago, it must have been about thirty years ago, in Patchogue, he had at the library had something in the Newsday. And uh, it said about Austin Rowe that Austin had, uh, uh, and when, when Washington came through here, and one of the things, a sideline, he was saying that Washington stopped in Patchogue somewhere. And, Hard Tavern. And he said that he had, let it be said, he, he said he, had Washington write in his diary, uh, let it be said, because he saw children eating um, potatoes and cooking potatoes right outside the, uh, the tavern. And so he said, let it be said that, that today I dined at Master So-and-So's Tavern. And they wrote that in the diary. But when they wrote it in the, in the Patrick letter, they said he asked it at the this Patchogue Tavern, you know. Well, he said that. Yeah, and, and they, they said that he said that, and yeah. so I didn't I didn't know one way or the other. But when I, I then I told my, this cousin of my wife that uh, this happened, and he got animated. No, he says he's done. He said he didn't dine at the tavern. He said he dined at Master So and So's Tavern. 
So he, he and he I, has a lot of information yeah. I know about. It. I have to trust Washington's diary. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a primary source. It was done at the time, and that's the only evidence I have. Yeah. If this is a primary source and we can verify that it came from that time period, that particular letter, that'd be great. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Yeah, we've been trying other to stuff. She has all these papers because he died, and uh, he has all these papers. And my wife and she says he has so much. And, uh, well, give it to the Patri uh, Historical Society. Let them go through it. Yeah, well, Don't even separate the stuff out. Don't say, well, I'll give it to them when I get it organized. Well, your grandson will be dead by then. <laughs> you know, give the, give the Historical Society these papers now. And, you know, and they'll organize them. And then you can go visit them when you're there and you know that they'll be preserved. We've been trying to do that because Austin Rowe was one of my wife's um, somehow cousin of yeah. one. Uh, well, you know Marjorie, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, no, get that stuff into an archive with an archivist who can uh, who can work on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, how the spy network network was acknowledged by Washington. Were they given any special rewards or acknowledgments or? Congressional Medal of Honor. Nothing, nothing. nothing. The only, the, it, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to spies. Number one, spies, it's not considered to be a legitimate occupation. And nobody is proud back then. Well, since 07, we're all proud of spies. But back then, nobody was proud of spies. Wow. And nobody wanted to be, I mean, Thompson mentions it in his, in his, uh, history of Long Island, 1839, but for the most part, people just didn't want to recognize that they were spying during the war. Wow. Spying on their neighbors, spying on friends. You know, like yes. But was William Floyd aware of any of these things? I mean, being that he was in, you know, out in Mastic, was he... In well, he wasn't in Mastic very much, um, and he certainly wasn't in Mastic during the war. Uh, he was in Congress. And when he came back after the war, he was so disgusted with what the British had done to his manor um, that um, he, he moved up Upstate, state New York. Yeah. And um, of course his daughter married Benjamin Talmadge. You all know that, right? She had a choice. She was going out with, um, with Madison, but I guess he was too short for her. <laughs> yes, Marjorie. What do we know about Hart Tavern? Did, did Hart come from the North Shore? I don't know anything about Hart Tavern. You don't? No. Uh -huh. I'm a North Shore guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know much about Rowe Tavern either, except that Art, Art Belladello owns it. And uh, he's a member of the Brigade of the American Revolution. And if you want to contribute to the preservation of the Rowe Tavern, I imagine he'd be glad to have the, to have the money. Yes. Yes, uh, Marjorie asked the question that I was going to ask, but uh, about Hart. Uh, yeah. To make a long story short, I, I, actually, I was looking in a, uh, I ran across uh, the town of uh, Huntington Records. Okay. 1668 to 1775, and a lot of the names like Rowe and Hart and some of the other names are there. Yeah. And I, and I've seen also seem to think I've seen where Hart. He's also associated, I believe, in St. Paul somewhat. And now he's down here. So in my mind, there, are there any the only hearts that I know in St. Talking are all black. Well, but uh, that doesn't mean anything. Oh, and I, I should have brought the thing yeah. in town. I'll Hunt tell you, records. if the British had known that everybody in the spy ring was either a first or second cousin, they might have arrested all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all first or second cousins. Every one of them. And Adam Smith Strong was not fooling around with uh, Abraham Woodhull because Sealer was his first cousin and he was a better soldier. So he was more dangerous. <laughs> yes? Aside from the Adam Strong story, what did you think of Brian Kilmeade's book in general? The book is okay. What I did was I crossed out in the notes and in the text every reference to 355 and so when my daughter read it, that's the version she read. <laughs> and she liked the book. It's okay. It's a novel. It's a novel. It has very few uh, notes or um, 
anything in it that you can check on. That's what's great about Alexander Rose's book. It's just loaded with, with uh, primary source material. But uh, Kilmeade is, is, is Fox and Friends, and he's got, he, he had an in to uh, be able to produce a book. I don't think if, if he was not Fox and Friends that the book would have gotten quite the uh, play that it did. But listen, everything. I'm very glad for these books. I'm very glad for Turn. In 2013, we were averaging between zero and three every Sunday at our exhibit on Spies, which opened in 2010. In 2014, we averaged 25. <laughs> My walking tour is Abraham Woodhull. In 2013, I averaged between 15 and 20. In 2014, I averaged more than 60, and one of my tours had 80 on it. About two of them had 80 on it. And you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for turn. I'm not sure I would even be invited over here. It's the other side of the island. People from the North Shore don't go to the South Shore. People from the South Shore don't go to the North Shore. Yes. Um, do they have any plans to make the historical sites a little better connected? I know when I've done it several times, you have a little sign and you can call in, and before the, even the calling in number was there, trying to do it, it's a little do what? disconnected. Do you see the sites like Caleb Brewster's or where Anna Strong's house was, and the different. We have you know, the the, the North Shore Heritage Alliance, which. Um, Unfortunately, it's taking patch up, but it's North Shore Heritage Alliance, um, and it runs from Oyster Bay all the way out East End. And they produced their first thing that they produced was the spy route on cell phone. So you can tune in, you can call the number, and then you can hit from one to twenty-two, and get every single site. And if you want to see where they are and a description of them. I wrote it and put it on the Emma S. Clark Library site. So you don't even have to go to the sites to read them, to listen to the uh, text about them. All you have to do is go to the Emma Clark site and uh, Emma S. Clark Memorial Library and uh, the, it will tell you all about those 22 sites, including the university and, uh, and Oyster Bay, Raynham Hall, and the graveyard where uh, Robert Townsend is buried. And at the um, university are three letters, original letters. One from Washington to Talmadge, telling him how invisible ink should work and other things. Um, and uh, another letter, um, basically the same thing. And uh, a letter from James J., who invented the invisible ink, um, for his brother. His brother John was a businessman and he was obsessed with security. So he wrote a lot of his letters in code. So I think that James J. didn't invent the invisible ink for General Washington because he didn't know it when, before the war started. He invented it for or developed it for his brother to use. And his brother gave it to General Washington. And after the war, after Washington was dead, in fact, um, he wrote this letter to Congress. I think it was actually after the War of 1812. Asking for repayment for the money that he didn't get for the Invisible Ink <laughs> during the war. Congress dilly-dallied, as Congress normally does, and they waited until he died and then it was, uh, they didn't have to worry about paying him. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we want to thank you all for coming tonight. We do. By the way, I'm Jim Rosell, and I'm the president of the Historical Society. Uh, we do have refreshments. Um, if you are a member and you have not paid your dues, that's the man to see over there. And we just want to thank you all. Oh, also, before you leave, can you please sign the book? Uh, we'd like to keep record of who came. 
And by the way, we are working hard on Rich to get a copy of that diary for the Patrick Historical Society. We're already, we've been on him for years, so he's a good friend of ours. Well, let's give another round of applause, please.